here. So I figured that out. Good. Just going to give a second for everyone to get in the room. Give a little bit more time. People are loading in. Perfect. Coaches, welcome to the Pro Coach Basketball Summit by Basketball Immersion and Coaches Clinic presented by Dr. Dish Basketball. Very excited. I am personally very excited for someone I've got a chance to know, uh, for Dallas Maverick assistant coach Mike Weiner to share NBA offense verbiage and nuance. And I know people are excited to hear the terminology and the different nuances of the game that you're going to share. Mike enters his 13th season this year with the Mavericks and has uh, seen, I've seen him present in clinics before. So I know you'll get tremendous value from Mike and uh, from Mike sharing the game. So welcome, Mike, and uh, enjoy. Hey, Chris. Good to see you. <laughs> Great to see you too, my friend. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Tremendous. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here in a second, but as you can see, I got a nice plush background going on here. This is reality, right? This is what everybody's office looks like, nice and organized and beautiful. Uh, anyways, I, I, I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say at the end of this and uh, communicate. Um, I think it'll kind of be a one-way thing to start, and then hopefully we can open it up at the end, uh, and then we'll go from there. I'm going to share my screen. If anybody has any issues, I think I can see that chat pretty well. Um, so feel free to shout at me or stop me, or if you you know got issues or whatever, just uh, holler at me, and I'll be happy to stop. I'm, I'm excited to be here on behalf of Chris and you know, Basketball Immersion, Coach Tube, and I know Dr. Dish is a part of this as well. Uh, I'm going into my Just Play uh, sports site here. Uh, we use them here at the Dallas, with the Dallas Mavericks, and um, they, they've been a great partner, and we're, we're, uh, we're excited to use uh, their technology. I'm going to cover uh, NBA offense, uh, verbiage and nuance. Um, the, the sets we're going to cover uh, aren't going to be anything probably earth-shattering. You've probably seen all of them. It's basic basketball, especially at the NBA level, um, but we're going to cover kind of the details of it and what, what terminology people um, use across the NBA and, and in other places. That's been the number one question over the last couple of months to me um, from other basketball coaches. Hey, uh, Mike, what, what do you guys use to call this? What do you call that? Well, what do you use for this terminology? How do you use this term to uh, flow into your offense? Or how do you use this to apply to your, um, your, your philosophies uh, in Dallas? Uh, so I'm going to cover that a little bit. I'll, I'll get a little background and kind of move on from there. Um, I will be remiss. I don't do any presentations or conversations uh, without talking about my family because uh, they are the number one priority in my life. Uh, my wife, Noelle, that's our wedding uh, over 10 years ago. My wife, Noelle, we've been dating since the sandbox and we're uh, happily married with two young boys, uh, Gavin and Wesley. They are the loves of my life and uh, they are my first priority. Uh, not basketball, these, these, they are my first priority. So obviously very excited in that picture and we're still excited. Uh, at least I am, I don't know if she is, but um, still very excited to be uh, married to my beautiful wife, Noel. My background, uh, I've been lucky, I've been blessed and I've been fortunate to be a part of uh, a lot of winning uh, in my career thus far. Um, this is obviously 2006, uh, no, 2007 with Coach Donovan uh, and the Florida Gators. I uh, started as a, uh, wipe the floor, pick up laundry, uh, pick up lunches, do whatever Coach Donovan and everyone else there. Uh, Larry Shia, Donnie Jones, uh, you know, Anthony Grants, any of those guys needed, I was going to do it. I uh, started there as a 17-year-old or 18-year-old freshman at the University of Florida and uh, worked my way up uh, at, to, as a manager and then a graduate manager um, from there. Um, lucky and blessed to be a part of that organization and continuing to move forward uh, learning the, the, the game of basketball. This is how, you know, see Brian and uh, a couple little ones there. Hasbrook, she's in college now. So it kind of tells you how, how long ago that was. Uh, again, I, I got to Dallas in 2008. Um, 
when uh, Coach Carlisle got the uh, head job here in Dallas um, and been with him ever since. Here's our locker room scene uh, right after we won in Miami in 2011. As you can see, Coach Carlisle there and our owner, Mark Huva, uh, Terry Stotts, Dwayne Casey here and there, Jason Kidd and all these guys. Uh, very fortunate and blessed to be part of it. And uh, just a small piece, um, very, very, very small piece of it. Uh, but these guys are, you know, will ever forever be in my hearts. Uh, Ron Butler, as you see there, I know a lot of heard about his story and, and who he's become as a man after, you know, going through a lot as a child and, and the uh, young teenager. Uh, just an absolute privilege to be friends with him and know him as a man and uh, kind of moving forward uh, to his next step. You know, he, he's done great. Uh, post post playing career and I'm excited to continue to watch him uh, here. Continuing, uh, obviously I told told you I got hired in 2008 as uh, on, the, on Coach Carlisle staff as his special assistant to the head coach. Uh, grew in that position and he's given me great opportunity to uh, to continue to grow. Um, I, I started like I told you at, at Florida and. Uh, was asked to go pick him up at the airport at Rick Carlisle up at the airport by coach Donovan and kind of host him and be a part and kind of get him to know around Gainesville and, uh, and those, and come to our practices there at University of Florida and just got to know him and kept in touch with him. And, and any young coaches I would ask and beg that you would uh, take the opportunity to reach out to those that you have contacts with, even if it's just a text, because I sent a text May 20th, uh, May 12th, uh, 2008 to coach. I, uh, excited about your opportunity in Dallas and would be on the first plane to Dallas. And from the next day, I, I was on that plane and got a, got a job the next day. So take that opportunity and, and, and great things will happen. I got that, you know, obviously part of the championship in 2011 and uh, was given the opportunity to lead uh, a couple of summer league teams. Here is 2017 in Orlando. We won the summer league championship. Uh, I was leading that group. And uh, I, I have this picture on here primarily because I wanted to show Daryl Armstrong and how excited he was. If you can see my mouse moving there, um, how excited he was. And, you know, obviously back in Orlando, his stomping grounds and uh, win the championship, he got the game ball there. We had a good time with it, but uh, that's my background in terms of, I had a couple of opportunities there. My biggest influence in coaching uh, from a head coach perspective is, is certainly these two men, um, uh, Billy Donovan and Rick Carlisle. They are truly innovators of the game. Um, coach Donovan, I, I, there's not a more passionate coach um, for his players and connecting to his players. I think that's really at the, the basis of how he's had such success on uh, multiple levels, uh, including getting, getting the, uh, the job this summer with Chicago. Um, he really has a way of connecting with players and being uh, a part of their lives and passionate about um, making uh, the best opportunity for them. And obviously Rick Carlisle, I'm, I'm, He's a mentor of mine, and uh, happy birthday to Rick. It's his birthday today, um, but uh, he truly has been great for me to learn from, and he's a mastermind. He leaves no stone unturned, and uh, we'll make sure that we're going to be prepared as we can always, as prepared as prepared could be. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story about that picture. That picture's from last year when uh, Mark Cuban and the, the – the, uh, Mayor and a few others in the city of Dallas dedicated a, a street to Dirk Nowitzki, Dirk Nowitzki Way in front of our arena. And uh, that suit coach has got on, it's a little baggy. Well, that suit is the same suit that he wore in that picture in, that, in Miami from 2011, hadn't, hadn't put it on since then. And he told the story at the press conference. That's uh, the same suit. The first time he wore it uh, was that, that day last year since the championship, just as a tribute to Dirk and all he did and all he did. He's done for the city of Dallas and, and continues to do uh, with his foundation and uh, several other things. But these are the biggest influences in my life. And, and I would be remiss not to mention some other assistants. I, I've said it before, Larry Scheidt, Stephen Silas, who, uh, you know, in some conversations currently, Jamal Mosley, Melvin Hunt, Tony Brown, uh, even our current, our current staff, obviously, uh, Scott Shamgod, Don, uh, Mike Shedd, Daryl Armstrong, Jenny Busick. And some others I've worked with over the years, uh, Donnie Jones, Anthony Grant, Jim O'Brien, Terry Stotts in Portland, Dwayne Casey in Detroit, uh, Monty Mathis, and then our players. Uh, I'll talk about a few of them later, but uh, that have come through here. Obviously, it starts with Dirk and ends with Dirk, but uh, to be around him and, and Jason Kidd, a first ballot Hall of Famer, and J.J. Barea, the ultimate competitor, um, 
you know, some of these guys, it's, it's been incredible. I talked about Karan. And then the, the modern generation here in Dallas with, with Luca and KP and Seth and those guys. Uh, quick, before we get into uh, kind of the offense terminology and such, a, a few philosophy things, um, kind of where, where my feet stand and where I'm going to go with it. Um, know your nose is something that's very important to me. My nose are my uh, crossing the line of my family and my faith. Um, those are the, the things that I, I just won't do if something crosses my family or my faith, but I'm out. I'm just going to abstain from it. And if that's a problem with somebody, then we'll have to handle that. But um, other than that, I'm going to tell my boss, and I'm going to tell, you know, Mark Cuban and Rick Carlisle and whoever else I'm going to, I'm going to get it done. Whatever they ask, whatever the task assigned, that's, it's going to be uh, accomplished. However we can get it done. And I believe that's one reason why I've been in, uh, you know, under coach Carlisle for, for 12 plus years and had some success. Uh, stories. Um, so that's one thing I like to share is, is know your nose, understand what, what, what is not possible for you from an uh, interpersonal, uh, interpersonal uh, uh, point of view, and then move on from there because you got to get it done. Uh, another one is success leaves footprints. Uh, like the men I've talked about uh, and ladies I talked about prior to this, they, they leave footprints and you got to step in them. And then eventually at some point you may step over them, but uh, I'm going to follow Billy Donovan and Rick Carlisle and, and all these Jim O'Brien and, and all these men that have come before me. I'm, I'm trying to step in their footprints and then at some point maybe go beyond, but right now we're, we're stepping in footprints and continuing to follow um, along their path. Philosophy continued. Um, this is kind of where what Coach Carlisle has me uh, doing what he's told me. Um, and, and no, this is not a, a cocky thing. It, it, make sure you understand the, the red the red uh, font there, expert in the room at the task assigned. You're not going to be the expert in the room at everything, uh, no matter how smart we all think we are or, 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 or not. Um, you're never going to be the expert in everything. Uh, that's why, you know, basketball coaches have assistant coaches to be assigned to different things. Um, but whatever task that is, especially if you're an assistant coach, be the expert at that task that you've been assigned. If you're assigned to prep for, uh, uh, you know, um, Morehouse College or you're assigned, to, you know, for NC State or you're assigned for the Sacramento Kings and that's your job, be the expert at that task. If you're assigned side out of bounds, be the expert at side out of bounds, whatever it may be, whatever task your head coach gives you or your athletic director, be the expert in the room at that task. You don't have to be the expert at everything. Um, for me, that's been primarily offense oriented um, and game preps. Uh, obviously, Coach Carlos splits up our game preps uh, throughout the season. Um, but uh, in, a, in a macro view, I've been more offense oriented um, in my 12 years. And that's just something that has kind of fallen to me from Coach Carlisle, who at, at most times you, you would say he's offense oriented, but uh, obviously has a great acumen for both. Uh, and then midway through this year, Coach Carlisle came to me and said, hey, I, I want you to focus more on defense this year, uh, about halfway through the year. And, was blessed to work with uh, Jamal Mosley this year towards the second half of it, you know, and, uh, and we tried to make some progress. Uh, we're still got a long ways to go in Dallas in terms of our defense, uh, and, you know, and continuing to get better um, because our offense has been up there um, for the last decade. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, Coach Carlisle uh, has told me I have to be a critical thinker. With all the noise that we've talked, you know, I'm sure you all know about the signal and the noise. Um, you got to be able to differentiate. You got to be able to critically think at those important times. Um, most people will be able to do that, you know, in their rooms watching film. You can critically think and kind of get through what you need to get through. But can you critically think at the moment? Um, it's a challenge, and 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 I hope to continue to get better at that. And I feel like I'm, you know, um, working towards that and in a good place with that uh, under Coach Carlisle's leadership. And thanks to him for that. Uh, but all this comes down to, you know. I'm in Dallas. I, I have an opportunity here in Dallas and continue to grow and I'm thankful for it, but it all comes down to relationships. If I wouldn't be in Dallas without it, I wouldn't be in Dallas without a relationship uh, with coach Donovan prior to that. Um, and with Mark Cuban and Donnie Nelson, um, your relationships matter. And I think everybody you know, has talked about that uh, in the last few days here in this clinic. And then obviously nationwide, we talk about relationships, not only in our uh, inside of our business, but within our families and within our communities. One thing I did this summer um, was get uncomfortable. Uh, 
we're all uncomfortable in COVID. We're all uncomfortable with what's going on. And we, we, we hope and pray that it gets better. And, and not only our society with our health things, but societal issues going on. Uh, but I would challenge each and every one of you to get uncomfortable with something else that can help you in your toolbox. Uh, we ask our players every summer to add something to their toolbox. Well, what are we adding to our toolbox? Um, this summer I had the opportunity to be an adjunct professor at Southern Methodist University uh, in the sport performance leadership uh, department. And it really was a challenge uh, to kind of get better at my Zoom presentation skills. Obviously it was all online uh, to get better at communicating uh, and touching everyone, uh, but not physically, obviously, or through a Zoom. Uh, it was just a uh, something to, to really challenge yourself. It, it got me uncomfortable and I got, I got better from it. And then uh, one major focus of that that I think Coach Carlisle does great and uh, I, I focused heavily on in my, in my class at SMU is being an athlete-centered approach when you're a coach. Uh, and that uh, some of the background of that comes from this book. And uh, whenever I gave a talk, I like to give either quotes or Book recommendations. Here's my book recommendations for everybody. Uh, Every Moment Matters from John O'Sullivan. This is how the world's uh, best coaches inspire their athletes to build championship teams. Kind of goes into detail. Um, this guy's a soccer coach, but uh, covers a lot of, a lot of ground. Um, and I think that, that that title really sums it up. Every moment matters. You got to take advantage of every moment you have with your team. Uh, you never know what, what moment is going to catch their eye. You never know what moment is going to click. For each individual athlete. Uh, so that's my book recommendation for you. And what does an athlete-centered environment look like? This is the uh, last couple of things before we get going here on uh, offense. Um, coaches become facilitators, learn to question athletes in order to help them to understand concepts and skills at a deeper level. And then uh, the coach sees the team as a collection of people with individual needs and individual development timelines, thus serving them within the team concept. Uh, I think that's what we need um, going forward in, in our society, not only on, uh, in general, but uh, we need to be uh, focused on individuals within the team concept. I think that's one reason why we had such success in 2011. Coach Carlisle kind of gave the keys to Jason Kidd and, and Dirk and said, go, um, and, you know, put you know, standards and parameters around it, but he gave them the keys. And um, that's kind of the success story unfolded especially offensively. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit, how, how that happened. So getting into some, that, that's kind of my philosophical look at things. Um, we'll jump into the um, offense side of it. And I, and I put on here a league of thieves. I think everybody understands. And, and in this case, being a thief is not a bad thing. We're all here to learn. We're here to share. I think that's why Chris Oliver's uh, running this clinic to share to share and to learn. And that's what, what we're coached to, but these other things are about. So it's okay. It's okay to steal things. Uh, so let's talk offense. Let's, let's get into it here. Modern NBA offense. How can we generate efficient shots on the vast majority of possessions? We all know the analytical world um, is a major factor, um, not only in the NBA, but in college and even high school level. Um, that's the question. How can we generate efficient shots on the vast majority of our possessions? There's going to be some shots that we, you know, the analytic world uh, isn't uh, uh, really in favor of. There's going to be some turnovers. There's going to be some, uh, you know, uh, missed opportunities. But we're talking about the line share of the possessions. How can we generate those shots? Well, in, in, in a general sense, we need repetition and, and in-game theory on how to get those shots. In practice, those are the shots you need to repeat over and over and over again. If that's not going to, if this certain shot, you know, a 17 foot step back is not going to be part of your repertoire during a game, we should probably be airing on, away from that. Now, if that's a shot that you shoot at an efficient level, uh, like several do in the NBA, then that's a shot we need to, you know, get reps at. Um, additionally, what, what this, this quote here says, don't steal their reps. Um, that's from a learning theory uh, that we can't jump on our players every second of every game. We must understand that they must learn through difficulties. And I think Jenny Busek talked about it in the, the uh, clinic yesterday. Um, people learn best when you quiz them, but they also learn best when, when they're tested, when they're in diverse environments, when they're in difficult environments. Uh, so don't steal the rep right away. Let them learn from their mistakes, uh, especially in practice. And that's what preseason games are for. That's what, you know, uh, especially younger players. Obviously when it gets to the playoffs and things, you, you have to, 
you know, kind of narrow your focus, but uh, try not to steal their reps. Don't steal their reps. And I like to be positive with things, but that's obviously a negative to start that sentence. Um, how can we be inclusive of our entire roster? Every player on an NBA roster or even collegially has a role. There's a reason they're on your team. Uh, they could be the end of the bench and they could be the, um, you know, obviously the, the spark. They could be the scorer off the bench. They could be the defender off the bench. They could be the future. They could be this. How do we design an offense that's inclusive of our entire roster while highlighting our best players? We certainly want our best players shooting the majority of the shots. How do we, how do we design that? How do we get that? Uh -uh, excuse me. How do we design our offense uh, around that? And that's what the, you know, the, the modern NBA offense is. Um, obviously, Houston has a different theory. We have a different theory. Uh, Utah does different things. Um, how can we be inclusive of our entire roster while maximizing our best players? Um, the next question is this. How can we be unpredictable? Uh, how can we basically play playoff offense? Because everybody knows in the playoffs, when you start to run plays, it gets really difficult. Um, in Dallas, it's one thing that we've really gotten away from. You know, Coach Carlisle loves to draw, call plays and draw plays, but he's gotten away from it way more than in, uh, than, than in the past. Um, nearly two-thirds of all of our possessions this year were some sort of early offense where he doesn't make a call, fast break, or random play. Um, this is where the league is going, space, pace, and unpredictability. Uh, everyone has a, a, a form that they like playing out of, but this is where the, the offense is going, and this is how you score, and this is how you win in the playoffs. Um, unpredictable offense with um, very – Staunch defense. Uh, how can we help our defense with our offense? Um, and I put in bold there, net gain is the most important. We love to be, you know, top five in offense and top five in defense and all these things. Um, but really, where, where is the net gain? Um, if you play faster, uh, if you take uh, three more threes, if you take more shots at the rim, transition defense schemes that apply to that. What about shooting early in the shot clock versus shooting late in the shot clock? Where is the net gain for your roster as opposed to the rest of the league or your conference or your district or whoever you're playing? Uh, you must figure out where it is for your team and your roster, where the net gain is. You might be better defensively, so you may need to slow the game down. You might be better in transition, so you need to speed the game up. You need to figure out the net gain of – my offense balance with my defense because unlike unlike football, we don't try another eleven guys out there. Um, it's got to be about the net net difference and the net gain for you uh, in designing your offense and, and what it is. And that's what you know all um, modern NBA offense is. Where, where can we get the most um, net gain uh, from our offense and our defense? It's what 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 all offenses are built around uh, in the NBA these days. So in terms of actions, 90 plus percent of all the actions are really the same. Uh, everybody runs the same stuff for the most part. Uh, as we'll see, everybody just calls them different things. They get into them a little different way, but most of the actions are the same. Um, you'll see wide pins, you'll see zippers, drags, double drags, and all these different things. Um, obviously, as we all know, people are shifting more towards five out actions with five men that can stretch the floor. We are in Dallas. We Obviously, Porzingis uh, played a lot of center for us this year, and he shoots it from, you know, deep. So we're, we're part of that movement. Uh, we're proud to be a part of that movement. Uh, we like offense. We like moving the ball. We like, we like shooting that uh, deep ball. Um, but understanding uh, what's going to be best for you and building that terminology around that. Um, you must develop your own terminology. Um, Obviously, I'm an assistant of Coach Carlisle, and he develops his terminology. We, we do our best to keep um, our terminology succinct. Uh, it, sometimes it doesn't work, but uh, we try to be the fewest syllables and try to be um, with hand motions and, and, and uh, visuals that match. Um, but this is how we build our identity as an offense, like who we are and then how do we communicate with our terminology. And, I, and as you see the line there, the bottom line is what works for you what works for your roster. Uh, you got to figure out your terminology and what works best for you and your roster. So we'll cover some of these things here. Um, they're going to be basic concepts, but uh, I hope to engage at the end of the session here uh, about um, different things. 
Uh, as you see here, we're talking about the early offense wipe in. Here's some names that uh, are used in the NBA, uh, just in case you need. Um, <clears throat> what are the steps of complete offense? Great. I'll hit that in a second. Um, early offense wide pin down here. This is, this is, um, you know, kind of the terminology, um, that, that hits the, what, in the NBA, the most used phrases. There's a few others, but this is the most used phrase, um, in terms of a wide pin down. Uh, we'll cover this video and then Larry, I'll hit you here in a second with, uh, with steps of creating a complete offense, uh, point quick wide up just for, um, sharing purposes. I'm not going to give out which team it has, which call, but Point, quick, wide, invert, single, touch. These are all quick hand signals that can be used. Um, let me show the video, and then, Larry, we'll hit your uh, question here shortly. The video may chop a little bit, but we'll do the best we can here. So here, here's an offense in action. Here's Atlanta. I got had to get a tribute to my good friend Vince Carter, who obviously retired this year and is going to be great on TV. But um, here's an offense, early wide pin. They got some dummy action on the top side here, as you see. Uh, Brunson and these guys, Seth Curry's uh, already communicating a switch. Jax is on the ball, Cleaver, and uh, we got Ryan broke off here, guarding the uh, wing. Notice one thing when we cover these wide pins and we get to these double wide pins, the point of the screen is different for every team. Here's John Collins going against uh, Vince Carter here. I I'm guessing he'd probably want the screen a step or two higher just because Vince's shooting ability. Um, you know, if, if, if Ryan would go under or Ryan curls, Maybe a step higher just because there's more space on the floor. It, it provides more room for John to go to the rim. Uh, you'll see a quick setup by Vince. Uh, we, get, but we get hit on the screen. We don't get a jump to the basketball uh, on the offensive side. And he gets a curl in the lane. And there's not much you can do about it when he gets to the rim like that. Um, but as you can see, just a quick early wide pin. Uh, some people call it point, invert, touch. Uh, wide, lots of different varieties. As you'll see, Duncan Robinson was a problem in the finals and throughout the playoffs. Here's the uh, spacing is key. Sometimes when you have such an elite shooter, he only needs a little pocket. That's why I put this on here. You see Kendrick Nunn bringing it up. We got Hardaway on, on, on Duncan Robinson. And obviously in our, our scouting, our personnel uh, meetings, he would be a bust over. We would not go under his screens. He does that here. We don't get a stun off the ball, which probably is a hindrance to why he got this shot off. Um, just quick early wide pins. And as you see, we talked about five out spacing. Well, they are deep in, in the perimeter here. Um, you see Jimmy Butler, who you know is a, a capable three-point shooter, but not doesn't shoot many on one a game. Uh, I think it's like 1.4 a game. He spaced at 30 feet. We're guarding him out there. Um, this is why a lot of teams are spacing out to this three-point line in 28, 29 feet. Here's another version, Brad Beal in it. We got uh, Ish Smith, not a quality three-point shooter hand on the basketball, so we should be able to give a lot of help here. Um, notice the space um, that Brad Beal is looking at here. He is a, above the free throw line extended, which makes it very difficult to top lock on the top side of the screen. Um, Thomas Bryant goes and sets the screen. He tells the, the, uh, his teammate to get out. So now he sets him up, and now he's got a curl action. What we would tell... Um, Thomas Bryant here in this situation, I'm not sure what, uh, what Scott Brooks does, but what we would tell our guys in this situation as a screener, uh, you must either sprint roll, speed roll to the rim with this left foot going to the rim quickly, or you must space immediately. Hanging in this uh, mid-range area in this no man's land doesn't create enough space. Um, so we would tell Thomas Bryant, if you're a, a dead roll guy, you must speed roll to the rim or you must pop immediately. He kind of hangs and lurks in that area. We would tell him either pop back um, right away or speed roll to the rim. Delon Wright does a fantastic job here getting in the lane, especially off a, a you know non-quality three-point shooter. He forces a shot that we would be okay with. Uh, I think I saw another question come in. Real fast, let's see. Coach, we can get to the questions at the end. Just keep going with this. Okay. All right, we'll do that. Uh, so we're looking at these wide pins and we did a great job there defending off of it, but just notice the difference. We looked at one, uh, just by itself opposite the basketball. We looked at one, um, you know, kind of tight to the lane line, just like Duncan Robinson. And then this one, he emptied it out in the, in the free throw lane line uh, elevated. 
Um, so there's a lot more room on the back side. Now, if you're going to do that, you better have some quality shooters on the near side. Um, but th these are the different types of things that the guys are looking at uh, with their early wide pin downs. That's that one. We'll go to the next thing. Um, double wide pin downs, as you see, um, a lot of different calls for this. It's used in, in almost every city in, in the NBA now. Away, Seattle, low, point, 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 touch, weak, and scrum. Um, you'll see here uh, Coach Steve Clifford uses it a lot. Uh, he likes it because a lot of the, the, the space for the ball handler, um, he's got some good shooters there in Orlando, you know, obviously good guys off the screens. But the space for the ball handler to attack is there. Uh, so guys that have elite quick point guards, you're thinking, you know, uh, Russell Westbrook, you're thinking, uh, you know, DJ Augustine is the guy he uses it for, Michael Carter-Williams that you used to. But um, these are the kind of guys that when they get that isolation space off of the weak uh, double pin down, they really can be a problem. And it's hard to really guard them in that space, as you'll see here. He's got Carter Williams here, and really the place for, for Terrence Ross, obviously a wing shooter they, they like to use a lot. Notice the spacing on the uh, on the uh, pins. As before, we looked at John Collins and the Vince Carter pin. He was down inside the lane line. These guys are basically straddling the three-point line uh, or just a half a step in, and Mo Bamba's there. Um, they are looking to get that three-point shot and try to elevate the floor as much as possible. This is a green light shot for Terrence Ross and, and, and Orlando. This is a green light, let it go. You know, they have no problems with this shot, and I don't think many people would. Um, good look for them. Um, obviously, a quality shot. And, and, and their crash games, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, what's an advantage? What's a disadvantage? We talked about that with, with net gain, net loss. Um, are you crashing? How many are you crashing? And where are you crashing from? Uh, certainly, it looks like. They told James Ennis he's a crash guy from the wing at the you know the two three position. Here's the uh, world champions setting their double wide pin away. Here's for Caldwell Pope. A lot of guys they they run this because there, there's there's room to play out of it. Again, look at the where the screens are taking place. This tells me that you know they really want to kind of look at the curl because the bass because they're they're deeper inside. Um, Lots of space, and now they're playing off the, the second side of this pin. The Kuzma's the initial screener, and now Caldwell Pope is clearing out. Again, watch Howard. We would this for us, especially with a guy like Dwight Howard. This would be a speed roll. As soon as that, that uh, trail defender is on the top side, we would tell him his left foot must go and get to the rim as quick as possible. We would want, obviously, James to space away a little bit, so he takes away that man out. Here's a shot that you know Kuzma makes at a high rate. Um, I'm not sure if it's the most efficient shot for him, but uh, certainly makes it here. And, and, and it's a good shot for him in this in this situation. Here's uh, us running it uh, here in Dallas. We got our guy. It depends on who the shooter is. We tell our guys, depending on where the shooter is, where to go get him. Uh, most times we're on that three-point line. But this is for Brunson, so we're a little inside. Does a good job reading the screen. They play that screen well. We play this little pitch action. We tell all of our bigs, and you'll see some of it here later, it, you don't necessarily always have to come for a ball screen. If you want to show your hands um, to the, to the uh, ball handler, we love to play pitch. That's our term for it. We play pitch. We flip it back. We get Kleber, set a screen, and uh, Wright loves to reject. We got a good space here. You see Brunson made that curl and decided that it, it was best case to go back out the near side. So we got both corners filled. We got an arc three-point shooter, and we got a ball handler downhill. These are the 10 shots we're encouraging. These catch-and-shoot threes. Um, we'll take on every look. There's your double wide pin. Some call away, some call uh, point, point low. It's there, There's a wide variety of them. Early offense pick and roll, you know, the, the very basic in transition drag. One thing I just want you to notice here in the NBA, um, uh, drag, pick, seven, nine, hip. Um, these are all terms that are used. Uh, Seven and 77 are obviously dragging, double dragging. You've seen, obviously heard those before. Uh, in transition here, I just want you to notice the pace at which they're bringing the ball to the floor. And this is Coach Donovan here in, in, in Oklahoma City. The dead corner spacing is big for them. They get to the floor. Their center, Noel, is behind the play. So he's taught to come into this drag. And now they're downhill. They're playing out of a bump and close. 
Um, we got Kleber tagging. Uh, we, in this situation, we wouldn't want Noel to get behind us, but I think he does here. Um, they have a shooter on the, on the backside fill up. Mm -hmm. We do a bad job uh, defending that. We'll take a look at that clip next year. Uh, so we're bringing a ball to the floor here. As you see, Grant understands that he needs to get through and find space. Not always do you have to be five out initially. Uh, most teams do end up that way, but you'll see Grant. He fills through the lane, doesn't have an opportunity, and now he bumps out to the perimeter, and you got Jokic on the pick and pop. These are the problems that, that are created by these bigs that can do both. The Jokic, obviously, is, is multi-skilled, Porzingis, Towns. These are the problems that they create because you're typically in a drop coverage. We wouldn't want to switch nearly as much against Murray and these other guys. Um, and now, if they can make that shot, you, you create a big problem. Again, the crash games, take a look at who's ought to go for them. They're looking at Grant and Craig coming from the corners, and they got their two guards back. This is part of that, Larry, uh, you asked about creating an offense. You got to you know, figure out how and, and who you want to crash. Another drag, as you see here, Milwaukee, interchangeable uh, parts, interchangeability is their huge thing. Um, they put their five men in every spot on the floor. Um, as you see here, Lopez is in the corner. Most five men defensively are not used to tagging on a pick and roll. Hence, we put, they put Powell in a bad situation here. Um, they're going downhill. We don't get a great tag, and we're off this three-point shooter. So these are the situations um, that you can um, – get into in the NBA, obviously, with skilled bigs and, and bigs that can do multiple things. Uh, double drags, double early offense, pick and roll, 77, dubs, 99, five, stack, Oklahoma, pick, pick, all, all varieties of terminology that are used uh, this year in the NBA for double early offense, pick and rolls. If you need some more terms, I'd be happy to help you. There's plenty. Um, this is just kind of a, a sampling of them. As you see here, look at the, the level of the screens. Uh, they have Bridges and Zeller here setting double high pick and roll. He's above the three-point line. This would be a decision point for this uh, on-ball defender. Is he going over? Is he going under? Who is that handling the basketball? They do a good job getting to the corners here. Now, this is a, something that doesn't happen very often in the NBA anymore. They decide to double roll this. Obviously, the three-point emphasis in the NBA and in basketball, but they decide to double roll this. This is the unpredictability I was talking about earlier. Maybe, maybe they do this every once in a while. It messes up their tag, bridges, rolls, and, and pops out. Um, likely not a design, but a read and react situation um, with, with, uh, with bridges, even at the three spot rolling. Um, this is, you know, kind of teaches the point that you don't have to be so rigid. Uh, they roll here with a five and a three and end up with virtually a layup going down the lane, a dunk going down the lane. So don't be so rigid all the time if you feel like your, your players have a, a solid basketball IQ. Here's an early 77. We get it sent to the sideline, uh, blue for us. We get it sent over there. There's an empty corner, so we felt like we should keep it over there. Here, here's the decision point. These screens, as we've been talking about through this, are above the three-point line. Um, you know, I think he's, a, he's putting half above it, and, and John Collins is standing on top of it. We would be a definite over on Young. We make a mistake here, and this is obviously a, an NBA skill level that can make this shot. But um, play with the level of your screens and double drags and double white pins and all these things. It uh, doesn't always have to be the same. We're uh, rolling here. So I just called this the early offense three-play interaction. Uh, the most famous name for this is pistol. But here's all the other names that are used. Push, sideline, bang, forehead, pencils, out, 74, Nash. Nash, obviously, and for the new Brooklyn Nets head coach, Steve Nash, and the thousands of times he ran this set under Mike D'Antoni. Um, as you see here, they give the option. This is us in the bubble against the Clippers. Um, Step up, handoff, throw ahead. I, I highlighted the step up and the handoff in this little presentation, but multiple options here with the trail big. Uh, we mess up this little step up. Likely was supposed to be a switch for us, but we didn't get it switched. So now they're downhill. 
as you see, they're very disciplined uh, under Doc Rivers uh, to stay in the corners and stay lifted and create all of this space. Uh, we mess up that switch and they get attacked to the rim. As you see here, it doesn't always have to be empty corner. Denver runs it, uh, I mean, uh, Utah runs it this way, has a little corner filled, and they run it in, into the center of the floor, which I kind of like as a, as a curveball every once in a while. Um, Coach Snyder does a great job uh, designing, uh, you know, multiple, multiple actions uh, to defend in a, in a certain possession. So they get to step up and throw over the top with a corner filled situation instead of a corner empty. Obviously, it takes away that baseline drive, but you've got a lot of space at the top of the floor um, in this area to operate if you have, uh, you know, obviously effective players in that area. Good screen by Jokic above the three-point line again. And pay attention to their crash games. They're talking through the corners, through the corners uh, to get that offensive rebound. Here's a few of ours. We are going to play empty-sided. We love the slip-out action, obviously, with Doncic. Um, being very dynamic with the basketball and capable of doing multiple things. We love creating a way, creating an issue um, for him. We throw it, we play the two man game, and now he pitches it. We talked about that pitch a second ago. Um, as you see here, I'll rewind it. As you see, he presents his hands, and now he's going to play pitch with Doncic, and then we got an open side, and he's downhill. Obviously, Portland would like to see Simons in there a little more to nail, but um, they get an open, we get an open side. Um, the Brazingas. Another look at a little slip out. Instead of slipping high, we are anticipating a show. So we, uh, we, we slip to the low side. Uh, these are different ways you can get at uh, this pistol action, slipping to the low side, and now he's playing ball screen or pitch. Hardaway does a great job reading and getting out, and now we're downhill into the lane. Notice the backside guys are spaced effectively and deep. Instead of playing the step-up game, here's a, just a little handoff. You can do the same thing out of this pistol, pencil, 21 look. It's just a little handoff, and now we're playing pitch with the big, the trail big. See another handoff, and we'll get a, a, a pretty wide open look, a pretty good look for Jackson off this handoff. So this is obviously a great way to get into some interactions with your big in a trail spot. Even if they're not going to set a pick and roll on that first one, you can get some weak side action on a handoff. Couple more looks at it. Right goes to handoff, immediate pitch, just like we talked about. Porzingis shows his hands. We're going to an immediate pitch, and now we can turn the corner. And instead of rolling, um, he's got Chandler on him. He figured that popping would be best because he's not typically uh, used to closing out on those guys. Uh, popping would be best for Porzingis, keeps the seven foot center out of the lane, and now we're downhill. Good decision by Brunson. Rolling along here. Hope everybody's uh, staying engaged here. We'll, we'll keep going here. Vertical uh, pin along the lane line. Uh, the most uh, famous is zipper, but other teams call it loop. Two up, one up, depending on the personnel, basic or C. A um, couple of different actions you can get to. I'll zoom through these quickly. I know we're going on time here. Quick zipper to a mid. They get. Uh, Jokic on a short action. As you see, Grant's going through. They're not five out. They got a guy underneath the basket. Different look. There's another look at a zipper to a, a weak side mid. Again, they're short here. They're not five out. Everybody's not five out all the time in the NBA. They get a roll and you know, underneath there for the marketing. Here's a weak side pin from Cleveland. I think we do a pretty good job here. Quick pin opposite, it's called the sleeper pin. Again, notice this level of the screen on these pin downs. He's inside the three-point line. Not as quality of a shooter, so we go through the gap, get a good nail help, and, and we get a good closeout. Now we're looking at shots that we want them to shoot, what their shot diet is, and what we want uh, their shot diet to be. That's good uh, for us against a, a non-three-point shooter. Here's a good look at uh, some action from Coach Brown, who I thought did a fantastic job in his tenure there in Philadelphia. Zipper action. When you have the shooting big, like so many do these days in the NBA, and I, you know, it may be at your level, 
running these zippers and then slashing or cutting the guy through that uh, would be the helper, as you see here. Horford's popping. Who would be the help guy typically? Weber. If Simmons goes through so that you don't get the help, um, uh, the stunt from Kleber, that wing defender. Obviously, they play second pick and roll, and he decides to roll. That's the unpredictability part, and they get an action with the boom. Lifted angle pick and roll, uh, kind of you know the, the way that everybody's operating these days. Uh, shake, elbow, angle, chest, step, hook, all names that are used. So here's Memphis. They're, they're going to go in a two-for-one situation here. I think they're going to hold for one shot and hope that we don't get it going back the other way. Um, obviously, this is they run this a lot for Morant. This is Tyus Jones. Um, but getting Morant downhill is a big part of their offense. Um, they set an angle ball screen, lifted, shooter, shooter, shooter on the perimeter. Um, you got to make a decision. Are you going to tag this big, slow them up, and give yourself a, a less chance to get out? Uh, or are you going to try and guard it with two players? Um, they do a good job setting a high angled ball screen, and getting downhill. This is the type of shot, you know, 16 foot or a 14 foot floater. You know, the analytics will tell you that you know, you're going to live with some of those. As we know, the shots go in. There's Aaron Holiday setting some bonus. They've got a big lifted here, uh, Miles Turner. Um, we're in on a tag. We're in on a tag. You got to make a decision. Are you going to live with this shot? Or are you going to stay in on that tag? Another look at it here. It doesn't always have to be for a high volume or high quality three-point shooter. Um, we're going to go under on this pick and roll with DeRozan. And just because of his skill level um, and determination, he gets downhill. So it doesn't always have to be for a, an elite shooter handling the basketball. Doesn't even get a great screen, but he's going to get downhill. He's going to get, you know, to the free throw line and, and possibly an N1 in that situation. Spain pick and roll, I think a favorite of everybody's right now. Uh, stack, shoulder, husker, rub, reverse, and rip. Um, the, the stack pick and roll with the rear screen. Um, has been a problem for a lot of teams to guard in the NBA recently. I think we're finally starting to turn the corner and figuring it out. Uh, I don't think we do a great job on this one. But they do a little misdirection from a side out of bounds. And then Joe Ingles is the rear screener. Notice the level of the screen by Gobert, forcing, um, hoping to force an over there. And you got Ingles rear screening the big. Communication defensively is huge on this, and, and Ingles getting a solid screen um, is huge here. He's downhill and creates a world of problems. You know, are you going to switch it? Are you going to corral it? What, what are you going to do against it? It's also a tough play to blitz just because that, that weak side rotator is you know, that decision maker where to, where to go on that uh, rear screener. Here's Sacramento, they get into it from a handoff. I like this little action, handoff into the Spain pick and roll, misdirection, and now they get the, a piece of them and he gets to the lane. Just different looks at, at how to get into that Spain pick and roll. As I said, Husker, shoulder, rubber burst are all terms that are used. And then kind of the last look at you know, some actions here before I kind of wrap up the uh, philosophical part of it and, and the basketball side of it before we get to questions. Um, Milwaukee, Mike Boonehoser and, and has done a fantastic job, obviously, in Atlanta before that and uh, been a leader in this area uh, of working the five out and working this, this three-man interaction at the top. Single side, swing, swing cuts, these are all names that are used in this type of action. Uh, there's several clips here, including some of ours. I'll go through some teaching points. As you'll see, they are spaced deep behind the three-point line and deep to the corners, and they are, as we talked about, um, unpredictable with where – uh, their players are. Here's a five man in the left corner. They got the four at the top, uh, and the two handling, and the ones in the corner. So uh, they are interchangeable. They get a reverse, a swing, a pin, and now they're playing out of this action. These three man interactions are really difficult to guard because there's so much space. They probably won't even change up further in the corner here, but there's so much space up top because of the quality of their shooting. Now they get a down and drive. 
game Orlando here. Now they got a uh, swinging it to the four, and they got wings interacting at the top, Marvin Williams and Chris Middleton. Now they get a swing to the opposite side. So the interchangeability of this um, has been a real big issue for teams to guard in the NBA and obviously how they succeeded and had the best record in the NBA. And here's the three-man interaction. This is a quick read for them, an automatic. If you go under this handoff, it's an automatic shot for their wing players. Quick handoff and a quick shot. Obviously, Cal Corp, an all-time three-point shooter here. Two and three interacting here at the top. Now they get to a little V action out of it. Very difficult to guard because they're so unpredictable, and they got the five-man in the corner. Here's uh, Taylor Jenkins' team in Memphis running it. Obviously, he was an assistant under Mike Budenholzer in, in uh, Milwaukee. Does a great job running it back here. They set it at single action. That quick pin action, that wide action, whatever you're going to call it. And now they're playing the pitch game like we talked about earlier. He presents his hands and gets a roll, and now we're going downhill. Another look at it here with Crowder bringing it up. Swing. This is what NBA offense is looking like these days. Multiple ball handlers, um, and threats all over the floor with the corner, the floor spaced. Here's us running it. We run a little action, quick pin back. And now one important uh, fact to note is um, reading this roller a pop. Um, if he rolls, uh, we should get a, a fill up here by Hardaway. If he pops, we should get this cut like we discussed earlier with the Horford play. Um, Porzingis actually kind of deeks him here, half rolls and pops back, and is wide open uh, for, a, for a catch and shoot. Obviously, hard I didn't cut because it was a little late decision. But these are the type of things that, that, are, that are causing problems around the NBA, and here's some, some terminologies that, that are being used. Um, I, I'll kind of share this as, as kind of summing up. Uh, what's next? That's also the, the next question people ask me. Interest of, of people around the league. Well, the three point rate is going to continue to rise. It's not going anywhere. Um, it certainly is, it, it is here to stay. It's going to keep going and going and going. Uh, you know, obviously, Houston and, and, and here in Dallas, we shot the most this year. Uh, micro ball, what they're doing in Houston, you know, they were ninth in defense after the Capella trade. They were 15th on the season. So they got better defensively during that last stretch when they, they, they traded their big men and went all. Uh, small, so will it be interesting to see what what happens there and what happens, you know, if that's a trend that that starts. Um, uh, to the opposition of that, size still matters. We saw the the size and strength um, that the Lakers played with throughout the playoffs and really, you know, kind of handled things uh, in Orlando. Uh, so size still matters. Uh, we've seen some creative things uh, on defenses lately with boxes and ones and different types of zone. You know, zone's not a new thing in the NBA. We were very successful using it in the playoffs in 2011. Um, you know, Coach Dwayne Casey was, was a big part of that. Um, in 2011, being a part, you know, kind of uh, orchestrating that zone and Jason Kidd and Dirk Nowitzki, very intelligent Hall of Fame players. But um, the zone is, is around and people use it as a weapon. Uh, and then, like I said before, the analytics side of it, um, so many smart people are working in basketball, not, not as though they weren't before, but they're coming in droves now. Um, analytics continue to push the boundaries of, of where we can go um, uh, from a from a, a basketball perspective. Um, so I will also say this before we get to questions, Chris. Uh, one thing I also do in every class, every opportunity to try to keep this you know, on the forefront is how, how I can how can I be better for you um, as 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 a person as. As a community, how can you serve your head coach? How can you be better for your players, your organizations? That should be our mindset. We should have a servant's mentality of how can we be, be better for you, be better for our audience, be better for our players. Um, by serving others, you will, you will grow and you will get better yourself. Uh, so with that, I would love to serve uh, each and every one of you that's in this uh, presentation. And you, Chris, how, how can I serve you and how can I be better for you and, and help each and every one of you? Well, thank you, Coach. That's uh, 
tremendous already. And uh, I know there's a few questions and probably a few more will get posted here and we'll wrap it up in the next uh, 10 minutes or so with a few questions. So uh, from uh, Coach Larry, you already noted this one, but uh, what are the steps to creating a complete offense? Um, I know that's a complex question and maybe keep it uh, as brief as possible. Yeah, I think, I think it goes back to one of the points I made earlier, Larry. I know this is probably a, a little general for you. I'd be happy to help as much as I can, you know, I, I reach out. Um, but um, you've got to figure out what um, type of offense is going to get you the best net gain from your offense and your defense as opposed to your opponents. Um, we're playing a certain style because we think that fits our roster best, and that's how we're going to, you know, uh, succeed in the league against the competition we have to play against. Um, so figure that out first and then try to highlight the skills of those players. Uh, if you have shooting, go with the five out. If you have, you know, guys that uh, are better around the rim, maybe some of those double roll actions. Uh, but start there, think macro, and then try to figure out what's best for your roster and your situation. It doesn't have to be what's best for the guy across town or, or the girl across town. It's got to be best for what your roster is consistent of. Good stuff from Coach, Coach Ryan. Uh, with your five out transition, the Big Ten's to run the middle. Uh, Milwaukee has opted to go more positionless, so running a little bit wider. Um, can you just talk about the pros and cons of each style? Very good, Ryan. Very, very observant. Um, that is true. Uh, we've talked a lot about going positionless. Um, we um, like the ball in, in Doncic's hands, you know, and Porzingis' hands, and, and some of our, our, our dynamic playmakers. Obviously, we have a roster full of guys that can do things with the basketball, but um, those guys feel comfortable in those areas. Do we try to get Porzingis and – and Powell and some of these other guys um, to the corners and some other spots on occasion, sure. Uh, but it just seems like that that's where our guys naturally flow to. And we're trying to be somewhat unpredictable with the actions up there. So we may not be as necessarily positionless as, as Milwaukee is, um, but we are certainly unpredictable with the actions that occur in those spots. From uh, Coach Todd, is, uh, he wants you to explain 77. That's a that's an application um, to terminology, like we talked about earlier. Um, the term seventy-seven comes from uh, a legendary coach way back, um, because he used for a pick and roll in transition. He used the term seven. He used numbers for everything. So his his single pick and roll would be a seven, and then because obviously you're you're talking about adding a second player, that would be a seventy-seven. So it's a double early offense pick and roll. Uh, is what's generally referred to as a 77. Uh, I think Coach Ryan here first, uh, I think you missed it, but what's the common terminology for the three-man action where the cutter uses a pin screen to receive a dribble handoff? Say it again, Chris. Coach Ryan, I think he said you covered this. What is the common terminology for the three-man action where the cutter uses a pin screen to receive a dribble handoff, so a stagger handoff. Did you? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The common term, you know, we talked about that a little bit. Away is a common term. Uh, point, point is a common term. Low is a common term. Uh, teams that use the the single pin as point use point, point. Um, but I would say those those are probably the most common. Away, point, point, um, and low. Uh, building on your commentary about uh, having uh, different players potentially handle the ball, uh, do you always want your best handler with the ball or is there freedom for other players to handle it too? Definitely freedom. I think that's part of um, the unpredictability and what Coach Carlisle really stresses. Look, I, I'm a product of, these, of Coach Carlisle and, and what we do in Dallas, I'm proud to work for him. And he's been great with um, you know, kind of giving ownership and giving uh, responsibility to all guys. Um, if you have an opportunity, go ahead. Obviously, the ball's going to end up in Doncic's hands and, you know, Jason Kidd's hands, you know, a while back. Uh, but um, we do give freedom to players to, to kind of do what they've been working on. Good stuff. Um, I, I think uh, – where is this next one? When uh, – if talking about emptying a side, how do teams try and stop it and what do you do to counter it? Uh, we like try to empty a side. What do you do to stop it? Yeah. How do you counter it? Um, I think he's getting at 
uh, there are times where we'd like to play out of the empty side um, just to give more space on that on that wing and, and it's not so crowded um, when you have a you know, an upper echelon player um, space is your friend um, you certainly want to utilize space as much as possible when you have one of those upper echelon players and, and we feel like we have one certainly here in Dallas um, so what guys do to counter it uh, what, what they do to kind of do it is really try to influence uh, both guys to the baseline. So obviously like a, what, what most teams call ice or down or blue um, and really get that big in between him and it, our, our ball handler in the basket and, and try to utilize more than one player in that space. Crowd it in essence is what they're doing. Uh, the question and maybe the last one is uh, about offensive install, which I think is a curious one that I get asked a lot about the NBA and how do you install offense is it primarily done at training camp? And then from there, do you install different pieces as you go along or how's the install happen? Well, as I said before, uh, Coach Carlisle's a genius and, uh, you know, I'm blessed to work for him. He, he's got an incredible mind when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but it kind of starts before training camp, Chris. We, in workouts in the summer, we kind of have a good idea in a traditional season. We're not talking about this season, but of course. we have kind of an idea of, uh, of the direction we're going. Um, and try to utilize some of that time you know, when guys are getting individual workouts or, or, you know, small group workouts, try to, you know, include some of those concepts so that when we get to training camp, even if it's a newer player, it's not completely new to them. Um, they're familiar with some of the concepts, some of the, the three men interaction we talked about that Milwaukee so good at. Um, we try to include those, some of those concepts inside of our workouts so that when we get to the whole piece in training camp, it's not, you know, a brand new thing like you're teaching a, you know, a five-year-old to read. It's a brand, it's not brand new. They've had some familiarity with it and they can kind of build on those building blocks as we move along and install things further and further and further. Coach, uh, tremendous, tremendous insights. And, uh, you know, this is what this clinic is all about, giving people rare access to uh, some, some things that they might not get access to unless they knew someone who coached in the NBA. So thank you for being our friend today. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity and in, in talking hoops with you, Chris, and uh, the community is great. And uh, as I said, I'm here to serve others uh, as much as I can. So I appreciate you and uh, thankful for everybody joining tonight. Well, you do it well. So thank you. And everyone stay well. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow for the last day of the clinic, everyone.